remedy that oversight, and he will submit proposed legislation to deal with this impending insolvency of Medicare forthwith. Madam President, I yield the floor and suggest the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
Reading is recognized. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I ask that the uh, quorum call be vitiated. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Madam President, I come to the floor uh, again today, as I have week after week since the uh, health care law has been passed, with a doctor's second opinion about the, the health care law. Uh, as you know, I've practiced medicine for uh, 25 years in Wyoming, taking care of Wyoming families. And, uh, Madam President, I have great concerns about this health care law that, uh, that has been passed by this body, uh, as well as the House, signed, uh, signed by the President. And the American people continue to learn more and more about this health care law. And the more they seem to learn, the more concern they have about this health care law being bad for patients, bad for providers, the nurses and the doctors who take care of those patients, and bad for the payers, the taxpayers of this country who are going to get uh, hit with an incredible bill. And, and now, Madam President, uh, the main thing I want to talk about today is a new report that has come out that's, that says to me that the taxpayers are going to get hit with a bill even much higher than they initially thought. And, and, and there, it's, a, it's a report from uh, a, a, a group, uh, it's the McKinsey Quarterly, and it's, and it's called How U.S. Health Care Reform Will Affect Employee Benefits. You know, Madam President, in the debates and in the speeches that the President had given uh, in the run-up to the election uh, and the vote on this bill, um, he said that if you had care that you liked, you could keep it. That American people had a plan that they liked, they'd be able to keep it. And it was a promise that he made to the American people, a promise that the American people wanted to believe. But now this report shows that the American people were right in being skeptical. And as we see, the more the American people learn about the health care law, the less they like it and the more they oppose it. So what, what this report says is that the, it is a shift away from employer-provided health insurance will be vastly greater than expected and will make sense for many companies and lower income workers alike. And when you work your way through this report, what you see is that more and more private companies that today, today provide health insurance for their employees will be much less likely to be willing to provide that insurance in the future. Well, why? Well, because it's going to be a lot more expensive to provide the insurance. The mandates, the quality, and the, the high level of, of expense involved uh, with providing that insurance, so that's going to be a significant burden to those companies. And if they don't provide the insurance at all, that there are going to be other chances for those employees, and it will actually be cheaper for the business to not provide insurance, give the people a raise, but just pay the penalty of the health care law and leave people without the insurance. When you take a look at this overall health care law, you see it as one where this body and this president raided Medicare, took $500 billion away from our seniors on Medicare, not to save Medicare, but to start a whole new government program. And now with the president's Payment Advisory Board, he additionally wants to ration Medicare. Ration Medicare. Rated Medicare? Ration Medicare? Is it any surprise that people on Medicare are having a much harder time finding a doctor as doctors refuse to see patients on Medicare? So with all of this, now we get this report. This report that says and this is a very reputable national consulting firm. This report says that they did a survey of 1,300 employers across the country, different industries, different geographies, different employer sizes, and the results really ought to be a huge wake-up call for all workers and all families across the country. Because what this, what this, what this group has seen from this study is that overall 30 percent of all employers, 30 percent of all employers will either definitely or probably, so likely, stop offering employer-sponsored health coverage in the years after 
2014. That's when Obamacare goes fully into effect. Now, among employers with a high awareness of how the program actually works for health care reform, who've actually studied what the law says, well, in that group, those who are most well-informed, they're saying more than 50 percent and upwards to 60 percent will pursue other options likely to stop offering their employers health coverage. Well, at least 30 percent of the employers would gain economically from dropping coverage even if they completely compensated the employees for the change of losing their insurance. You know, this is very alarming for our country. And I will tell you, Madam President, that uh, there was a, was a, a really well-written uh, editorial in yesterday's uh, Wall Street Journal by Grace Marie Turner, and I'm going to have included as part of my uh, testimony. Um, she's the president of the Galen Institute uh, and co-author of a, of, a, of a book called Why Obamacare is Wrong for America. Having read the book, I will tell you a lot of the things I've been talking about during the debate leading up to the vote on Obamacare and that I've been talking about afterwards as a doctor's second opinion are included in her book. But she specifically writes about, no, you can't keep your health insurance. Now, there are about 150 million Americans who get their coverage at work. We're not talking about people on Medicare. We're talking about non-elderly Americans who get their coverage at work. The Congressional Budget Office, when we were debating the health care law, they estimated that, oh, maybe 9 million, 10 million of those people are about 7% of the employees who currently get their health insurance through work may lose their health insurance at work, in spite of the fact that the president says, if you like what you have, you can keep it. But this survey of 1,300 different companies, organizations that provide health insurance, you know, 30% of them, so, you know, I don't think we're going to follow that route. Well, you're talking about a significantly larger number than the Congressional Budget Office had even anticipated. The numbers are astonishing. And in a study last year, Doug holtz eakin who is the former director of the Congressional Budget Office, he estimated not what this, the current CBO said, well, you know, maybe 10 million. He thought maybe 35 million workers would be moved out of, out of employer-covered plans uh, into subsidized coverage paid for by the taxpayers. And he thought by getting to that number, it would add an additional trillion dollars to the estimate of what the real costs were going to be for the President's health care law. If these numbers are true, this newer, higher number of 30 percent pulling out, and maybe 50 percent once they find out what's actually in the law and the mandates on these businesses, the additional costs at a time when we're looking at 9.1 percent unemployment in this country, the costs are going to go even higher with the significant subsidies that exist for families making up to $88,000 a year. So I come to the floor, Madam President, to say that uh, the more we learn about this health care law, the more unintended consequences, that many of the predictions made about this health care law from this side of the aisle are now coming true. And I've spoken in the past about, about waivers. We now are at a point where three million people who get their health insurance through work Three million people covered with health insurance in this country have gotten waivers. Whole states have gotten waivers so that they don't have to live under the mandates of the health care law. And they're going to be back for waivers again next year and the year after that. We see additional concern with what's really in this health care law. As Nancy Pelosi said, first you have to pass it before you get to find out what's in it. As more and more people find out what's in it, we're finding that more and more people who maybe had coverage that they liked, are not going to be able to keep that coverage, are going to lose that coverage. And the taxpayers are going to get stuck footing the bill. And that's why I come back to the floor week after week with a doctor's second opinion. 
because there's new information that comes out week after week as this McKinsey and Company study report came out this week. And that's why, Madam President, I continue to say we need to repeal and replace this terribly broken health care law. Thank you, Madam President. With that, I yield the floor and note the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
Uh, Mr. President, I have to speak as if it were any business. Uh, we are in a quorum I suggest, call. Yeah, I suggest further proceedings to the quorum call, quorum call be dispensed with. Without objection. Thank you. Mr. President, I ask to speak as if it were any business. Without objection. Mr. President, the book of Matthew, chapter 23, verses 11-12, read, The greatest among you will be your servant. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. I rise today to recognize five of Montana's great servants, five Montana heroes. Our state has faced severe flooding, unrelenting flooding, for the past several weeks. Water levels rising, Montanans across the state stepping up to help. This is in the essence of what it means to be a Montanan, stepping up to help fellow Montanans. Ordinary folks doing extraordinary things for their friends and neighbors. We are all in this together. That's why I've begun calling attention to Montana heroes going above and beyond the call of duty and the floods that we are experiencing in our state today. I want to recognize Pastor Kathy Moorhead of the United Methodist Church and Father Daniel Watham of St. Benedict's Church of Roundup. Last week, Kathy and Daniel showed me the flood damage caused by rising waters from the nearby Muscle Shell River. Most of the town of Roundup has been underwater for days. I remember many times I've gone to the Busy Bee Cafe in Roundup. Never in my wildest dreams I ever think that that restaurant might be underwater. Today, a few days ago it was, to floods have come back again. It's not entirely underwater, but so much of it is, it's just virtually destroyed. Kathy and Daniel took it upon themselves to make sure their neighbors had a hot meal, a dry place to sleep, medical care, a shoulder to cry on, and it's food not only for those who are displaced by the floods, but also for the National Guard. So the National Guard doesn't have to eat all those MRAPs, those, not the MRAPs, but those rations that they otherwise would have to eat. I, mean, I talked to the Guard. They're so appreciative. They don't have to eat that, um, well, that, that food they otherwise would be given. Ask anyone around up, they'll tell you that Kathy and Daniel's outstanding efforts continue to be indispensable. Flood waters have returned to Roundup, and our prayers are with them all today. This month, the Crow Indian tribe also faced devastating floods. Rising water has severed food and water supplies. No drinking water. Rushing water has swept away bridges, streets. As soon as the flood waters struck the Crow Reservation, Crow tribe member April Twinita got to work. April worked with the Red Cross to set up shelter for food victims. She made sure the Indian Health Service had the latest information about where medical care was most urgently needed. She was universally recognized as the go-to person for help. April, April Twinita. April has been working 18-hour days, sleeping on the floor of the Crow Housing Authority, doing whatever it takes to help her community. April's hard work inspires all of us to help each other through the floods in any way we can. When Box Elder burst its banks, floodwaters destroyed the Harris family north of Mill Iron, just outside of Ekalakwa. Neighbors Charlie and Gail Burns hopped on four-wheelers and went to rescue the Harris family of seven. When they arrived, the Harris home was under six feet of water, rapidly rising. They offered the Harris family a warm and safe place to stay, a shoulder to cry on, and a helping hand as they have worked to save their cattle and salvage personal belongings from the destroyed homes. Gail Brenson said, we're Montanans. This is what we do. Pastor Kathy, Father Dan, April, Charlie, and Gail are the best of the best Montana has to offer. They represent our can-do attitude, our willingness to help our neighbor, and our belief is that when times are tough, we know that we are the strongest when we work together. There are hundreds of other unsung heroes across Montana, and I'm calling on all Montanans to share their stories of ordinary folks doing extraordinary things for their friends and neighbors. Whether on Facebook or by calling my office, we want to hear these inspiring stories. We want to share them. You know, some folks in our state say it's somewhat true. that Montana is really one big town. We tend to know each other. We're a big area, few people 
but we tend to know each other, about one or two degrees of separation. We're really one big, small town. We're there to help each other. So in closing, Mr. President, I want to share a humble thank you for all the Montana's heroes back home. I don't know what we'd do without you. Thank you for your service. Mr. President, I do the floor. Senator from Missouri. Missouri has withstood a number of uh, tremendous natural disasters this spring. In fact, uh, the floods that uh, our, our good friend uh, from Montana just talked about are headed uh, down the uh, Missouri River from uh, Montana to the Dakotas to, uh, to uh, Missouri right now. Uh, we've had floods along the Mississippi. We've had floods of the Black River that required the evacuation of part of Poplar Bluff, Missouri. We've had tornadoes in both St. Louis and Joplin. Uh, and now, as I said, the Missouri River floods, the Missouri River is, going to, is beginning to reflect uh, what has happened upstream, the above normal snowpack that we don't see much of, but we see it when it melts in the spring. Uh, and high rainfall amounts this spring have made the difference in what's happening in, in our state. Um, the flooding along the Missouri River, which is about to get to crisis stage, will now join floods along the Mississippi River, the Black River, and tornadoes in St. Louis and Joplin. Uh, river levels are expected to rise near record levels and remain there until early or mid-August. Uh, this, of course, will put a tremendous pressure on our levee system. Uh, the estimates that I heard this week that were that uh, uh, between now and two weeks from today, uh, there will be at least two dozen levees underwater, which means the water would have got high enough to come over the tops of those levees and maybe, as, maybe over 50 levees on the Missouri River before it gets to St. Louis uh, will be underwater and will, and will have water on both sides of them until well into the summer. And Of course, that begins to undermine the very basis of the levee itself when it stands in water on both sides. Uh, the Corps and local sponsors are working to reinforce the levees along the Missouri River. Uh, we see uh, that the Department of Agriculture and the Corps also has to get engaged to get the damaged land cleared and rehabilitated uh, for all this levee protection to be restored. There's some discussion uh, in the opening of the levee in the boot heel at a place called Bird's Point that had been the plan to open that levee in a flood disaster since 1937, but it hadn't happened since 1937. Uh, 130,000 additional acres of farmland means at this moment we probably have 500,000 acres of farmland, a little more than that, underwater, and that number will be much higher than that by this time next week. Uh, but that 130,000 acres at Bird's Point uh, will still be underwater most of next year unless the Corps goes back in as they committed they would and gets a temporary levy that come, becomes a permanent levy in as soon as possible. Uh, we also, uh, Mr. President, can't, uh, over us, can't underestimate, and it would be hard to even overestimate, the challenges that uh, Joplin, Missouri uh, faces, a, a city that the death toll has now exceeded, from a tornado has exceeded uh, the death toll in any tornado in the last uh, 50 years. I think mid-1950s was the last time this much loss of life occurred in a tornado. I, I live about 60 miles from Joplin in Springfield, Missouri, and I represented uh, Joplin and Springfield both in the House of Representatives for 14 years. I had, a, I had an office in Joplin. I was there, I've been there literally hundreds of times uh, and uh, as a southwest Missourian, I've seen lots of tornado damage, uh, but I've never seen anything like this damage. I, I went to the area uh, Tuesday after the tornado hit on, on uh, over the weekend. I think the tornado hit on Sunday afternoon late. I was there most of the day Tuesday. I was riding down streets with a, with a, with a veteran police sergeant that both he and I had been down many times. And neither of us could ever really tell quite where we were because the devastation was that great. Every street looked like the street right next to it. The, the buildings were ground up. The two-by-fours had just become, uh, had become toothpicks. Uh, it was almost unrecognizable. Uh, this same tornado, if it would have hit 
and stayed on the ground for six miles in, in a, an area of farmland would have done some damage, but there just wouldn't have been nearly as much to damage. Uh, as it happened, it, it ripped through uh, the city of Joplin in a, in a swath that was at least a half a mile wide and at some places three quarters of a mile wide, stayed on the ground for six miles and destroyed approximately 30 percent of the buildings in a town of 50,000 people. Uh, 141 people were killed, including those that have died in hospitals from injuries since the tornado because of the tornado. More than 900 people were injured. 8,000 homes and, and apartments were destroyed. And I think here the word destroyed is the right word. Others were damaged. These were destroyed. 8,000 places where people lived three weeks ago aren't there today, and more than 500 commercial properties were demolished uh, by this, uh, this, this devastating tornado. Homes, churches, the high school, uh, the Votech school, three elementary schools, the Catholic school at all levels, all gone. Uh, and then other schools damaged. You know, how do you just get back to school uh, in August and September of this year with those schools gone is a huge challenge, one that a community would, would assume it would never have, to, uh, have to, to meet. But the community has been meeting it, as have people from all over the country and particularly from our state. Rescue efforts uh, led by groups like Missouri Task Force One, and other public safety officials, the fire departments, the law enforcement, the medical personnel, uh, the volunteers have up till now been tireless, but I can tell you they're getting pretty tired. People in Missouri and across America have been overwhelmingly generous with their time and resources in the aftermath of this uh, storm, and all Missourians are grateful for it. Uh, large corporations and small community organizations and individuals have helped. People have responded to calls on the phone by, by doing whatever they were asked to do to make a small donation. The, the, the General Motors Foundation announced a $1,000 grant to the Red Cross along with uh, two vehicles, full-size vans, and uh, free access to their OnStar service after the disaster. Uh, the Ford Motor Company donated another $50,000 uh, to Feeding uh, America for Joplin, and uh, their employees in the Kansas City plant are assisting as volunteers in relief efforts. Walmart committed a million dollars. Home Depot and Walmart both had a Walmart Supercenter and a Home Depot store were totally demolished, 100 percent demolished. Uh, and in both cases, they had late Sunday afternoon shoppers in them. One story, Mr. President, is a, a man and his four-year-old and one-year-old. I'm not sure they were on the way to the Home Depot, but at the last minute they were running into the Home Depot thinking that would be the safest place to be, and the big, those big concrete walls collapsed inward, and uh, the mom that had sent them to get light bulbs or whatever she'd sent them to get never saw those three people that were so much of her life before. Uh, the St. Louis Cardinals donated $25,000 to Convoy of Hope. The Kansas City Royals and Kansas City Chiefs each gave $35,000 to Heart to Heart International. Duracell opened a power relief trailer. Uh, Tide opened a Loads of Hope location offering laundry services for the thousands of affected families. Heart of Missouri United Way collected over a million dollars and pledged 100 percent of those funds that were raised in that drive would go to Joplin. Target contributed $95,000 to relief. AT&T and Verizon both gave 50,000. Sprint, a Missouri company, a Kansas City area-based company, gave 100,000. Tamco gave a million. Their headquarters are in Joplin. Their headquarters weren't affected, but many of their employees was. Uh, Love's Travel Shop gave 150,000. Great Southern and Southwest Missouri Bank both donated 10,000. The Girl Scouts in Houston, Missouri, were collecting toys for the children of Joplin who'd lost their toys. Uh, the University of Missouri produced tornado relief T-shirts with the slogan "One State, One Spirit, One Mizzou," and the Mizzou football team and DeRose Restaurant partnered to fill a semi-truck of groceries 
and other items to send to the location. The American Red Cross, the Harvesters Community Food Network, sent 14,000 ready-to-eat meals. Uh, the Kansas Speedway, the Highway Roadhouse and Kitchen in Grove City collected items for victims. The Ozark Technical Community College collecting funds to help people. The students in, in a high school at St. Louis, which had had its own tornado, uh, sent things to, uh, to Joplin as well. So, Mr. Speaker, uh, our, FEMA's doing what they can do, or Mr. President, rather. FEMA's doing what they can do. We need to prioritize spending, as I reached the conclusion of my remarks and mentioned the people who needed to be mentioned. I mentioned, uh, I sent President Obama a letter. I spoke with Secretary Napolitano shortly after this disaster, uh, insisting that the federal government do what we did in Katrina and reimburse taxpayers for their expenses at the 100 percent level. Uh, we've won, gone from 75 to 90, so only 10 more percent, and I'll be happy with that number. Uh, 75 percent was the first number discussed, but we're at 90 now. Uh, the federal government needs to do this. Um, local utility companies need to get the same kind of assistance others have had in similar disasters. Uh, and in all cases, uh, Mr. President, uh, the first responders were people's neighbors. Uh, their neighbors will still be there six months later when people are still struggling. Uh, but with thanks to everyone who has helped, with appreciation for the federal employees who have been there, uh, and uh, absolute insistence that we do everything we need to do uh, to treat this disaster as it needs to be treated, because it truly is a disaster, uh, and, um, and I'll be working uh, with uh, every, everything we can find to make this situation a, a challenge that the community can meet, and uh, I... Um, would uh, yield my time. Senator from Rhode Island. Mr. President, uh, I would ask Shams consent that after I'm recognized, uh, Senator Whitehouse will be recognized briefly, we are speaking on the same topic uh, for up to 10 minutes, and then at the conclusion of Senator Whitehouse, Senator Alexander of Tennessee will be recognized. Without objection. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. President, I'm pleased to rise today along with my colleague, Senator Whitehouse, to help mark the 350th anniversary of the settlement of Block Island, Rhode Island. Block Island sits 12 miles south of coastal Rhode Island and for over three centuries has contributed to the economic and ecologic vitality of my home state. I, it has a rich history. In 1614, the Dutch merchant and explorer Adrian Block chartered the island, which is named for him. In 1661, colonists from Massachusetts sailed to Block Island and established a community that would later become the town of New Shore. During the Revolutionary War, Block Islanders warned American soldiers of approaching British ships by lighting fires on Beacon Hill, the island's highest point. And over the past 200 years, Block Island has constructed two lighthouses that have provided safe passage for countless sailors and travelers. Today, Block Island is home to over 1,000 permanent residents and welcomes up to 20,000 visitors each day during the tourist season. Block Island has been graced by the visits of two sitting presidents, President Ulysses S. Grant in 1875 and in 1999 by President William Jefferson Clinton. I was pleased to have guided President Clinton around the Mohegan Bluffs and the historic Southeast Lighthouse, which overlooks the Atlantic Ocean, during his visit, along with the First Lady, now Secretary of State Hillary Rodden Clinton. Throughout the years, the local community has worked hard to preserve the island's natural beauty and landmarks. In the 1980s and early 1990s, Captain John R. Lewis, a Block Island resident known to all as Rob, spearheaded a campaign to save the Southeast Lighthouse, which was threatened by eroding shoreline. With a coalition of friends and local residents, Bob uh, worked to secure nearly $1 million in federal funding, and he persuaded Brock Islanders to help raise $270,000 through donations. I must also applaud the efforts of Senator John H. Chafee and Senator Claiborne Pell, my predecessors, who worked very hard, particularly for Senator Chafee, to ensure support for the, the movement of the Southeast Light. Their efforts in conjunction with these federal leaders and state leaders save this historic landmark, which still stands today. 
Block Island is not only unique for its rich history, it also has a beautiful landscape. Over 40% of the island is now preserved land. The island boasts dramatic bluffs, pristine beaches, and 25 miles of public hiking trails. Over 40 kinds of endangered species call Block Island home, and thousands of migratory birds pass through each year, making this a truly exceptional place. Indeed, Block Island was included on the Nature Conservancy's list of last great places. This honor identifies sites in the Western Hemisphere with significant biodiversity and ecosystems with rare or endangered species. Generations of Block Islanders have preserved what the Narragansett Indian tribe called God's Little Island. As we celebrate the 350th anniversary of Block Island settlement, it is fitting that we recognize and congratulate Block Islanders for all their effort to preserve one of our country's most treasured places. And I would yield the floor to my colleague. President. The other senator from Rhode Island. Mr. President, thank you. I rise today to join my uh, distinguished senior colleague, Senator Reed, in commemorating the 350th anniversary of Block Island, and I thank him for his leadership in organizing this moment of recognition. Every Rhode Islander can recall their first trip out to Block Island. For most, it starts with a drive down to Galilee, where countless visitors have boarded the Block Island ferries, the Carol Jean, the Block Island, and the Anna Sea. The ride from Galilee lasts about an hour, winding out of the Point Judith Harbor of Refuge and into the open ocean. And as the mainland, with all its cares and concerns, slips away, off the stern, a small speck on the horizon grows larger with each passing minute. Soon the great bluffs of the island come into view, followed by the friendly hustle and bustle of Block Island's old harbor. As the ferry pulls into the dock, the full scene unfolds. The National Hotel, Ballard's Inn, the docks and moorings, and all the shops and restaurants along Water Street. As you step ashore, you can't help but feel enchanted by the scene. A mere 12 miles separate the island from the mainland of our ocean state, but can easily seem a world away. Generations of young Rhode Islanders have made that trip, and most of them will continue returning year after year, only to find, with a sigh of relief, that the scene is just about as they left it. It's no wonder that the Nature Conservancy has named Block Island as one of the Earth's last great places. Formed by a receding glacier thousands of years ago, the land was first inhabited by the Narragansett Indians, who named their home God's Little Island. It took its modern name from Adrian Block, a Dutch explorer who charted the island in 1614. It was later settled by a group of families from Massachusetts in 1661, 350 years ago this year. In the centuries since, Block Island has been occupied by British redcoats during the War of 1812, served as home to artillery spotters in World War II, and become a favorite destination for sailors, fishermen, and families across the region and indeed across the country. Today, the island is a mainstay of Rhode Island's tourism industry. The Southeast Lighthouse, which Senator Reid spoke about, is one of the many must-sees for Ocean State tourists, right up there with historic Newport and the Slater Mill in Pawtucket. And the jobs generated by Block Island, from the ferry workers to the shop owners, are a real help to our economy in these tough times. So I'm happy to join Senator Reid today to commemorate 350 years of history for the people of the town of New Shoreham. Congratulations on this historic milestone. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the distinguished senator from Tennessee for his courtesy, and I yield the floor. Senator.